In the film First Reformed, a reverend and an environmentalist are experiencing existential crises, each waging a battle between hope and despair. In one exchange, the environmentalist shares his conflicting feelings about being an expectant father, yet having to answer for the catastrophic effects climate change will have on the earth his unborn daughter will inherit as an adult. He asks, what will I say when she looks at me and asks, you let this happen? Reverend Tiller responds by describing the need to embrace both despair and hope in our lives, suggesting without some despair, there is no need for hope, while at the same time extolling us that too much despair blinds us from seeing any hope at all. The effects of their exchanges are both thrilling and devastating. In almost every aspect of our lives, in ways big and small, we can see the ideas of hope and despair plodding along a continuum, we in the middle, like a swinging pendulum swaying from one side to the next. When we fall sick, we feel despair at what we're unable to do. When we begin to feel better, we're hopeful at what we can now accomplish. When we fail at work, we feel despair at wasted effort and time. When a new project comes along, we feel hopeful at what success it might bring. When we have a fight with our partner, we feel despair at the pall it casts over our days. When we make up, life feels right again. Within our personal lives, events will bring despair one moment and hope the next. Often in these instances, there are things firmly within our control that can help us swing that balance. In the larger world order, though, when we consider the state of our planet, our country, our politics, it becomes trickier. They feel beyond our control, and we feel powerless. In our daily lives, it is important to recognize the yin and yang of hope and despair and how we are feeding these two impulses. How much time do you spend mired in the daily news of doom and gloom? How many conversations you're having with Eeyore-like friends? Conversely, how much time are you spending with your head in the clouds? How many optimistic conversations do you have with the rainbows and unicorns set of friends? In the stirring conclusion of First Reformed, it offers that the middle ground between hope and despair is occupied by grace, the disposition or an act of kindness, courtesy, or clemency. When in doubt, move the pendulum with an act of grace. I'm Bob McKinnon, and you're listening to Attribution, where people from all walks of life reflect on who and what has contributed to where they ended up. Our hope is after each episode, you feel a little more inspired, grateful, or supported than when you first hit play. Today I'm talking with the Reverend Dr. Esau McCauley. He's an assistant professor of New Testament at Wheaton College and author of Reading While Black, African-American Biblical Interpretation as an Exercise in Hope. This was a moving and provocative conversation that could have gone on for hours as we discussed issues of struggle, poverty, race, and faith. I learned a lot, and I hope you will too. Enjoy. I was really looking forward to this conversation to begin with after reading your New York Times piece and reaching out and was thrilled that you would uh, join us in preparing last night. I was listening to some other things that you had done and I just wanted to thank you for the education you gave me. You were you were delivering a lecture, uh, and you uh, it was a lecture in which you gave a history of the white church in ten minutes and a history of the black experience in church in thirty. And uh, and even though it's not your responsibility to teach, uh, as you mentioned before, I I was really humbled by what you had to say and learned a tremendous amount. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. It's really weird to have stuff on the internet because you never know when people are going to find out when they Google. So <laughs> I'm glad you liked what you found. <laughs> Again, what originally drew me to your work uh, was I picked up the paper one morning and I saw this piece and it says, how do I, I think the title was, I grew up poor. How do I raise middle-class kids? Yes. And I was like, yeah, I, I want to know that because <laughs> I've been, I've been struggling with similar uh, quandaries. And I was so drawn to your writing and how forthright and vulnerable you were in sharing your personal experience. So one, I appreciate that. I try to do that in my own practice. But I I was really looking to sort of dive into that and some of the things that you shared in that story. But then I'd also like to expand a little bit more in terms of the role of faith in, in who we are and how it impacts where we end up in life. 
Well, thank you. I, I want to say I hope the people who haven't read the article will, will recognize that I don't solve the problem in the article. <laughs> I was putting out a cry to help. And people have asked me, well, what should we do? And I was like, I don't know. I think there's a line in the piece where I said, I'll let you know in 20 years. And <laughs> That's right. Because I, I, don't, I don't know the answer, but I'm looking forward to talking more about it. It's something that occupies way more of my time than probably any other question when it comes to parenting. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, I'm a bigger fan of inquiry more so than advocacy, right? So I think asking the questions is the first step and people figure it out once they're prompted uh, with the questions that maybe they hadn't previously considered. The one thing I'll say in that piece, and we're sort of trained not to do this, yes. but I started, I don't know if you did this, but I started reading some of the comments to that on the Times and there were, mm, there were plenty. And if you haven't, I think it's safe to dive into. Okay, because I've learned, one of the things that I learned is not to read the comments. And so I, I checked out of reading the comments in my New York Times pieces in particular about a year ago. And so may, maybe I'll dive back into those heady waters after this podcast, after this interview. I read it and it was uh, it echoed a lot of what I was saying. Like, thank you so much for writing this. I've struggled with the same things, people sharing their own experiences. And I hear you. I mean, there's often not a lot of value in going down rabbit holes of what people say online just by the nature of that discourse. But I've actually had some interesting experiences. I once wrote a piece years ago for the Huffington Post in the aftermath of the tragedy at Sandy Hook and then started diving into the comments afterwards thinking that there were going to be a lot of people who were, yeah, right on, we need to do something about this. And in fact, it was a lot of people who were proponents of gun rights, right? And who were pushing back at what I said. And I actually took the time to answer each comment and reply. And again, to your earlier point, even though we didn't solve the problem, yeah. all of them ended with a mutual respect. Like, thank you for taking the time to sort of engage with this. Most people don't, you know, appreciate where you're coming from. And so it was, it was at least a positive experience, yeah. which, you know, we often don't have with people who we disagree with. I think that maybe, um, and I probably shouldn't put this out into the, um, the internet or the world, but I, sometimes I wonder if I'm tough enough for this public life. Mm. Because even in my writing, it's vulnerable. And so I don't write from the position of I figured out everything in life and here is, you know, the solution in five easy steps. Uh, there's usually when I sit down to write, it's something that stirs within me. And so I write it and it's almost like giving a piece of yourself or like one yeah. of you, you know, and then when people go, you know, your child is ugly or something like that. It just, it, it hurts me. <laughs> yeah. I'm not built for tough skin, but I feel like what we really need as a society is more empathy. Yeah. And when people are mean, I tend to go towards being vulnerable, mm. which means I can only handle so much meanness at one, in any given moment. And so I understand. And, and the other thing that is really interesting is it depends on the topic that I'm writing about. So if it's something I'm personally invested in, it's much harder for me to engage. If I'm a few steps removed, um, then I can kind of speak about it. So if it's something on gun violence, but I'm not a direct victim of gun violence, then that's one way to have the conversation. But if it's a particular trauma, if I'm talking about race or something that I've experienced as a person, then the conversation is never about the topic. I'm kind of involved in it. Right. And so I think that all of those things are a little bit tricky when it comes to figuring out what's the healthy way of engage. I've been thinking a lot, and I don't know if you have too. I've been thinking a lot about what healthy, and this isn't the reason why you invited me here, but what healthy engagement is publicly. Mm. Because we seem to be all so angry with one another. And I'm trying to find ways to kind of bring a little bit of vulnerability and empathy back into the world. You know, my thought is, I, I believe that people have a tendency to be less mean when you're more vulnerable. So if you lead with vulnerability and yeah. authenticity, then people, you know, give you more of a pass. Yeah. You know, like, hey, this is your personal experience. I get it. The other thing too is I don't think there's enough of it, right? So we try to, we act tough, you know, we act like we have the answers. And I know that when I walk into classrooms and I talk with students and I share sort of my stories of how I grew up, I see how much it's appreciated because it creates an environment where they feel safer to share their experiences. And then once they share what their struggles may have been, you're able to better engage them you know, in this capacity as a teacher or professor, then had you just made assumptions about who they were. So I think the more in which you can create environments where anyone feels comfortable sharing their lived experience, uh, yeah. regardless of what that is, 
But I hear you too. I mean, I, I don't like to get dinged or criticized <laughs> like the next guy, especially when it's something about yourself, yeah. right? One of the interesting things, and one of the things I'm really grateful for to the editors of the New York Times, I write a column about once a month. And when they first started asking me to do it, I thought I had to make these big swings. Mm. So in other words, I thought I had to talk about whatever was happening in the news cycle or some big national global event. And I found myself being drawn to like the much smaller stories. Yeah. So there's the piece that we're talking about now, but there's also, you know, my wife was in the military and she got deployed for six months during the middle of the pandemic. And I talked about raising my children there. I've, I've written about taking my son just to baseball practice during the course of the pandemic. And I really, I've really been grateful for my editors and the people at the Times for giving me space just to sit back and write about what it means to actually just live a life and to lead with my own vulnerabilities. Mm. And the fact that I, I am rarely, even in matters of faith, telling people like what they must do. I am yeah. talking about how these things impact me. And so my writing style is, if um, the voice that I found over the last couple of years really is someone who's just trying to make sense of life as it appears to him. Yeah, I think it performs incredible service because, again, I think that, at least with some of the pieces I've read of yours, there's a, there's a universal element to it or it's certainly enough something that other people can relate to. And, again, you're posing questions that maybe they haven't, you know, uh, fully considered. And, yeah. you know, in doing so, I think it's a real, you know, act of, uh, of generosity. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I, I really do. It's, it's always... You know, sometimes the entirety the entirety of a piece grows out of a sentence, mm. and I'll get an idea that comes to my mind, and I'll I will spend and I, and I hate to say this to the to the reader, I'll spend fifteen hundred or twelve hundred words finding a reason to kind of build around this sentence, and the idea that was at the heart of the piece was um, I wish I could give, I, I don't want my kids to suffer what I suffered, but I wish that I could give them the feeling. Yeah, And there's this feeling that I find myself always trying to communicate to my children of hunger or desire or maybe um, grit. And that grit was created through suffering. And I'm sure there must be another way to get grit because people get grit without suffering. Um, people who've grown up with many resources are hard workers, but that's how I know how to get how to get it. And so, all that I had in my he my head at the beginning of this piece is, how do you give that feeling to children without making them go through what you went through? Because you know that everybody who you went, who went through what you went through didn't get there, right. and so that was that was basically it. That was that was the overarching question, and it's such a non news cycle idea. If, if I can also confess some things, it was initially not even about Thanksgiving. Right. It was initially just about this piece, and then they said, "Well, Thanksgiving is coming up. Can you rewrite it and and put it in a Thanksgiving context?" Because um, the holidays are coming up and we think that a lot of people will be with their families during the season. And that was a great suggestion by my editor. And they ended up coming out right on Thanksgiving. And so it was, it was just really wanting to have that. And I've been surprised by how many people have that exact same question. What do I do with these kids? I want to go back for a second for the, especially for those yeah. people who maybe didn't read the piece, because, you know, there's two parts to that there there's, I grew up poor and how do I raise middle-class kids? Yeah. A lot of it does seem to sort of revolve around the role of your mom, right? Like, yes. you know, that you had, a, you know, and, and, and I once was sitting with two national experts in poverty and I was like, Hey, can you tell me like, you know, not that there's, you know, any kind of one single solution, but like, how does someone like me end up where I am? you know, versus a lot of other kids, is there anything you, and they both, it was like, you know, oh, you know, when someone says something at the same time and they say, you owe me a Coke, they both said a buffer. And it was yeah. this notion of a single adult who helped you sort of make sense of all the difficulty around you. And so I, I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about, you know, where you grew up, what it was like, and then your, the role of your mom at that point and what that, what you still carry f from her with you as you, uh, as you move forward. Yeah, I think that it's really hard to talk about poverty because you can talk about the fast, the fantastic elements of it. So I grew up in an urban black area in um, Huntsville, Alabama during the like 80s and the 90s. 
the height of the crack, crack epidemic. And so on one level, people see that and they think about all the movies that they saw, maybe Boys in the Hood and those kinds of things. But what I try to say is that it wasn't dangerous all of the time. So like 90% of the time, I felt safe. But, you know, maybe once every six months, I thought I was in a place where my life could be in danger because of this, the location I was in. And so it was more of heightened awareness. And then it was like, the, there's a monotony to being poor. You know, you're just always wondering like where the food's going to come from mm-hmm. or every year, um, you know, the school year is about to start. You don't have the new clothes, you know, to, to wear to school. You're often moving because, you know, you can't afford to pay uh, the rent. And so we're moving from place to place. And every place that we moved, it, we went lower and lower and lower down the economic ladder. And so I like to talk about my childhood is a slow descent into mm. um, real poverty. But the other thing that, I, that, that that gets lost in that is how much joy there was. Because, you know, when you're a kid, there's sometimes you're just playing basketball in the backyard. You don't know that you're poor. You just think that I'm just a kid playing basketball. And so it's hard to capture the complexity of that life and not turn yourself into a ratio alger. Right. But what I would say about my mom, and I've thought about this a lot. I'm writing a book about this. Um, and this is where this piece comes from. I think the role of imagination can't be underplayed. In other ways, and I don't know if my mom knew that she was doing this, but she helped me think all of the time that although this is what you see, this isn't all that there is. Right. And even if she couldn't expose me to it, like by taking me other places, I never got on a plane until I was in college. I think I probably never went beyond like the, I'm from I'm from Huntsville, Alabama, Atlanta, Georgia, which is like two and a half hours away. It's probably the furthest I ever went away from home as a child. But she 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 managed to to instill in me this idea that I'm not limited by what I can see. And mm-hmm. maybe this is the role that faith plays in it, that like, you know, that although all of these things seem to be stacked against you. But, you know, historically, my ancestors were enslaved and they prayed to God and God liberated them. And if you pray to God, God will help you get through your circumstances, too. And so I think that it really was this idea over and over again. And she told me in a thousand ways that you're not limited by your circumstances. And she made it a contest. This is something else that like that I, that I thought a lot about. So my mom would say, like, those white people across town, they say that you aren't as smart as them. They say that you're never going to be anything but a thug. They say you're never going to be anything but a criminal. And they have all these resources. You have nothing. What are you going to do about it? So one year, um, so that's like, that's my mom. But I'll give you an an analogy that gives you a picture of what this was like. This is, it was a sports, but it gets to the same, same context. We grew up, the school that I, that I, that I used to attend is now shut down. But at the time we went to Birmingham, which is about an hour and a half away to play a football game. And we went to this really rich school. I won't say the name of the school, but it's in this rich suburbs in Birmingham. And you know, the coach normally gives you an inspiring pregame speech to kind of get everybody worked up. But our coach didn't give us a pregame speech that day. What he did was he got someone to give us the keys to the building of the school. So the stadium was around the corner. We went to the school. This is a true story. All black high school that we come from. He took us into the building and walked us around the school. He took us to the lunchroom. He took us to the computer lab. He took us to like their science lab. And then we all left and we walked out. And he said, they live like this every day. And that was the pre-game speech. (laughs) (laughs) And we went out there and beat them by like a thousand points. Yeah. But but the point of that was they have these resources that you don't. And they think that makes them better than you. Show them that that, that those resources don't define them and it doesn't define you as lesser than. And I would say that my mom and my community consistently made my education a question of the worth of black people Mm. and a kind of a contest of wills like you versus the world and show them. And so she didn't have, that's what I mean. She didn't have resources. She just had imagination and this, this idea that you can prove the world wrong. You know, it's interesting when you tell those two stories, I was recently talking to as a professor and researcher in Northwestern by the name of Dan McAdams, and his work all revolves around life narratives. And he talks about something he refers to as the anthology of the self. It's like the collection of stories you carry with you 
that who define who you were. And, and I have this, I'm, I'm the same boat. Like, you know, I'm sure, I don't know, I'm assuming you've told those stories before because they're seminal to your experience, right? Yes, yes. And, and it is interesting because, you know, there are individuals who helped shape those stories, your coach, your mom, et cetera. And I think, you know, similarly, my mom, you know, she used to, when I was younger, she called me the, the little professor because I wore glasses, you know, she didn't know anyone who went to college or anything like that, but it was like, oh, I guess that means maybe I'm smart and I can do it. And conversely, uh, at one point she had uh, married a guy and he was an angry, mean person. And the number of times he called me lazy and said, I wouldn't amount to anything. uh, As awful as that was, I can't argue with the fact that it fueled me in some ways, right? Yeah. A desire to prove someone wrong. And so, you know, it is interesting, this sort of ongoing you know, struggle to make sense of our struggle, right? You know, yeah. and on one hand, you know, you need to, because the alternative is what? Like, you know, just acceptance or failure or depression or whatever. But the other thing that that I, I, I sometimes worry about is that if we solely rely on belief in ourselves, which is important and necessary, right? So believing in yourself makes success possible, but not necessarily probable because of all the other factors that can hold us apart. And I wonder how you, how you sort of square that, you know, like your outcome versus maybe other people you grew up with. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that because there, there's a part of the article where I talked about ordinary pathways to success. One of the things that was interesting to me when I got to college was how many ordinary people that I found there. What I mean by that is a lot of the African-Americans, it was a mostly white school. A lot of the African-Americans had stories like I did. They came from poverty. They were the first ones in their their family to go to college. And there were other students and there were white students for whom this was the case, too, who came from kind of rural Alabama and Tennessee. And they, they, they were kind of there. But there was a whole other class of people who I'd never met before which were just kind of wealthy kids who were kind of like C plus students. And they said, you know, I kind of partied and drank all the way through high school. And then I kind of got serious later. And so even in college, they wouldn't be terribly serious. They kind of got serious somewhere in their twenties. Yeah. And I thought, man, I didn't know anybody from my neighborhood who was as nonchalant as those people who also succeeded. And that's when I actually began to understand like what racism and structural racism actually was. And what it was, was it gave people space to be mediocre. In other words, what I felt like justice, when I think about justice, when I think about equality means is that black people have to have the opportunity just to be ordinary people who make it. Mm -hmm. In other words, I both like and reject my story. In other words, yes, I made it because I had grit. But there were tons of students who were kind of B, B plus, C students who in a different context would have had the time and space to kind of find themselves. And one of the things that I, that, that I, that I really, really push for is not for the exceptional to flourish, but for the ordinary to give us a chance to find themselves. Mm. And I think I say that, that justice is like having ordinary pathway to success. Because I think that as long as the African-American stories in particular are the pull yourself up by your Bruce Trapp stories. It can sometimes re-instantiate the narrative or, or, or the, the picture that this is what it ought to take to succeed in society. And I don't think that's the case. I think that, I think that what happened to me was not the fact that I was exceptional, but that things kind of broke my way. I mean, right. I can give you, I can give you a thousand examples from other places, but I'll just say, for example, one day my house was like, I lived in a rough part of the, I lived in a rough neighborhood and my house was shot up in a drive-by and I was sitting kind of playing video games on my like Nintendo. And when they started shooting, I didn't move because I said, they're shooting the whole house. So there's no reason to go like why duck? Cause the right. bullets are everywhere. But then after um, they can't see this, I'm, I'm making this, this, this position in, in my hands, but after the thing went away and, and I, and I went and I looked, there was a bullet hole, like, two or three, you know, like a foot to the right of me. And I thought if I had leaned to that side, I could have gotten shot. Yeah. And so like, I didn't not get shot because I was more talented. I didn't get shot because I was blessed to not to miss the bullet. And so well, then what is justice? What is, what is, what is equality? What does the future look like? Like someone who just 
misses the bullet. Another story that happened to me is one time I was taking an advanced class. And the people who know about AP classes know that you can take a test at the end of the semester to get college credit if you make a high enough score on it. But I didn't have any money to take the test. So I had taken the class, but I couldn't afford to take the test. And my teacher decided that she was going to pay for the test. And she paid for it. She said, Esau, I'll pay for it. You just come to all of the study sessions. She paid for the test. She went. To, I went to all of the study sessions. And then when I passed, I never forget, you talk about the stories that define us. She came to me and handed me the, the score. And, you know, I opened it up and I saw the thing. And she says, you have college credit. You can do it. You can. And I was a junior at the time. Yeah. You can go to college. Well, how many other students could have had that? opportunity to see themselves as college students because the teacher decided to to kind of put a little bit of time into them. And so I know for a fact that I am not exceptional. I remember my neighborhood. I remember how many kids were just like me who had different circumstances, who just went to the same parties that I went to and just happened to get arrested. I'm sorry. I'm not, forgive me for like feeling like this is story time. But when I was in between college and graduate school, I had like a summer. I had a summer um, off, and I was working at a kind of like a factory to kind of work. You know, it's like a twelve hour kind of temporary job. And when I started working there, a friend of mine who I knew who I had known from when I was in high school was also working there. But the difference is he had just gotten out of jail. And I just graduated from college and I was spending, you know, those couple of months making some money before I went to graduate school and he was kind of restarting his life. But that 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 student there was not radically different from me in forms in terms of talent. He just had some circumstances kind of not go his way and he found himself in the legal system. And so I understand clearly how haphazard life is and had I made a different decision here or there, my life could have been radically different. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You make the, you know, the comment that you're not exceptional, right? And I know what you mean by the intention of that, like you inherently are not exceptional, but your story and the outcome is the exception relative to the rule in terms of just, a, if, I'm sure, you know, you've looked yeah. at this, the percentages in terms of your likelihood if you're born in poverty to move up, you know, one or two ladders on the rung and it's not, it's not great. Yeah. And going back to the article, it resonated so much because so many details of your story uh, were, you know, things that I had experienced. So I, I experienced both urban and rural poverty. So I grew up in Chelsea, Massachusetts, you know, over the Tobin Bridge in Boston. Then my family moved, um, or my mom moved us to uh, rural Pennsylvania, where we lived in a trailer park. Interestingly enough, my first uh, flight was for work. And it was embarrassing when my boss had to tell me how to actually helped me with my, my seat buckle, you know, because yeah. I didn't know my, I didn't know that that was a part of the deal. Yeah. My sister in the trailer park similarly had a bullet fly right by her head. Yeah. And so there were so many details that go in there, but, but again, I don't want to sort of lean into, you know, what people may hear is like the tragic parts, right? Because yeah. I, there was something else that you wrote and I don't know if it was in that piece or something else that you said, I love my neighborhood. I love my neighborhood, but I hated what it did to me. And I loved it because I saw the potential. Mm. I saw other black people striving to make the best of their circumstances. I remember what it was like to be, you know, to to be in like these little um, academic bowls, you know, and you kind of go and you'd face off against the, you know, the, the rich school across town. I remember how we studied and how we worked to kind of prove ourselves. And I, and I remember like these moments of real beauty where we'd be like at a pep rally and everybody was there and it was exciting. It was joyful. But I also remember the violence and the casual cruelty and the way that we treated one another. And so my neighborhood was both of those things. And the hard part is people from outside of the community only know about one part of it. And that's the negative that they can see, that mm-hmm. they can touch. I remember this, and I don't remember this in detail. People may Google it and find it's not exactly true. But in my brain, I remember this story or something close to it. There was like a running tally in the local paper how many days in a row there had been a fight in my school. I don't know if it was reported on periodically. There's been so, and like, that's what they thought about. Jail Johnson High School was the place where people fought, fought all of the time. But I was like, we're, we're also the place where we strive to become something more. And so it's just really hard to put both of those things into the same context. 
It's almost like a family. Nobody can yeah. talk about your family, but you know that your family is dysfunctional. <laughs> You know, and so that's part of the dynamic. Yeah, but it's interesting because you you do you love your family, and I also I'm not saying anything that she wouldn't agree with. My mom made her fair share of you know bad calls and choices that impacted us and things like that. But I give her a pass. Yes, you know what I mean because I know how hard it was, right? And so I don't know if you still, you know, I don't know how. First of all, I don't know where you live relative to where you grew up, or how often you yeah. go back, or what your current relationship is. But yeah, I'm very defensive of the places I grew up and try not to be critical. I will yeah. say this, you know, it's I'm finding it harder in some ways because of just where we are as a country and these some of these places have, have grown differently politically and, and whatnot than where I've now gone. So it's, it's it's an ongoing challenge. But But even in that context, I'm just aware of there are external forces that shape what people do. Yeah. And that's not to sort of absolve them of their sort of choices, but it does lend itself to a little bit of, of, uh, you know, of compassion and, and, and defending them, you know? I'm live, I live on the um, outside of Chicago and I grew up in Alabama, so I'm pretty far from where I, where I, where I once was yep. raised. And I go back periodically, um, not, not as often as I should, because I'm just a different person. And our lives, in a sense, diverged. In other words, I went on to do the things that I did. And many of the people in my community, not all of them, lots of people went on to do great things. So it's not all the people who left who thrived. But there's certain there's certain time, there's certain senses in which I can understand it and I can explain some elements of the neighborhood that I grew up in, but there's still a sense in which the hopelessness mm. um, can sometimes be your little grating. And so I can go there and it's usually about after two or three days, it starts to get to me um, emotionally yeah. because you can't fix it and, and they don't want you to fix it. And so it's really hard to go accept people for who they are and realize that you can't swoop in and save everything. One of the things that I've noticed is it's actually easier to do things outside of your community. In other words, I could go into Chicago because I'm not from Chicago and do better work than I could when I go back to my neighborhood because right. I'm just Esau from around the way. Yeah, yeah. And so um, in that sense, it's actually, I serve communities like my community that I knew, but I don't serve that particular community as much because it's just, it feels awkward. Yeah. And they're my own family. You know, I remember one time talking to a friend of mine who was like kind of selling drugs and I, I write for the you know the New York Times and I have a you know a book that's so well. How can I convince this person not to sell? Like what can I say? Like, the, right. the, like I've known them. We've known each other our whole life. Like what am I going to say? Like please stop selling drugs. It's just like it feels like awkward. So you know we talked about what it was like in high school. We kind of chatted for a little bit and we we caught up. But then it was just like good to see you and we kind of adapt. And I've tried before. To say, hey man, you know, you know, is there any way I could, you know? But it feels very pedantic and yeah. very, uh, and so it's really hard to to engage in 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 that kind of work in the very place that you came from. You know, I'm in the same boat, both in terms of what you described is like the the length of time, you know, that feels comfortable, and also the feeling of both the distance that's been created, you know, both physical from moving place, education, different life experience, et cetera, that it's like what you want to do as much good as you can um, in the places in which you grew up, but you're also just aware of the of the limitations. One of the things that I realized is when I go back home, it's, it's this weird inversion that I get more credit for not changing than I get for changing. In other words, yeah. the first 18 years that we spent together is where my authenticity lies. Yep. And I have to show them, no, 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 no. We were on the co we were on the corner together. I was with you when you did A, B, and C. Then they go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you're still you. And so then... All of the stuff that I did after I left the community, in some senses, is seen as suspect. And they want to make sure that I haven't lost myself yeah. in the context of acquiring these things. And I talk differently. It's just, it's just, it's it's inevitable. You know, my center structure changed, you know, when you when you live in an academic environment. And so it's hard to even completely inhabit those spaces in the same way. And it's heartbreaking. I had a, um, a cousin of mine who called me on the phone a few months ago. 
we had been really close um, when we were growing up. We had kind of slid further apart. But he called me on the phone. We had a good conversation. And he said, I see what you are doing now. I couldn't understand it mm. because I thought that you were abandoning us. Yeah. But I understand why you did what you did. And it's just, it's the, here's the weird part about all of this. We're talking about I'm 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. I'm growing up in an environment that is that is, that not many people thrive from. But there are other 15, 16, 17, and 18-year-olds who are alongside of me. And I didn't always do well by them. But I was 16, 17, 18 years old. Yeah. There was no adult there. And so you're now, you now get to this place where, you know, I'm, I'm in my 40s. And I realized, wow, when I was doing this, I could have turned to my cousin and said, hey, you should make this move. But I didn't know that. Right. And so by the time I did figure it out, it was too late. And so you have this real sense in which if I knew how my steps were going to work, I could have told you, this is the blind leading the blind. How could, an, how could another 17-year-old or 18-year-old tell a 14-year-old what they need to do to get to college? Yeah. I didn't know. I was the first one. So now my, but my, my cousin or, my, or, or a friend of mine doesn't get to go to college. And have these other opportunities. And I feel like I failed them because we were friends. Right. And that's that's the real sense in a frustration that I wish that I could have carried more people with me or given them the path. And so a lot of what I write about now is for the or even the work that I do is to help open up that path to people who are in that situation, even if I can help the people who were there with me at the time. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you obviously learn from your own experiences at the time and, and it is, you know, it's funny. I mean, how much of it is the water that you're swimming in, right? So, you know, you, you said you were the first, you were the first, how are you going to teach someone you didn't know you're figuring on your own. I was in a similar boat, you know, but I'm going to guess we both probably live in neighborhoods right now where the expectation is that, you know, you've got four children, which by the way, kudos three for <laughs> me is a, is a lot. Uh, but but the expectation is that they will go to college, right? Yeah. And if they choose not to go to college, that'll be some sort of, you know, display of probably a privilege because they're going to go yeah. and do something else, you know, and have support for it. And yet you have environments where that is not the expectation, Yeah, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, it shouldn't, you know, if, we, if, if societally we're leaving it on like the one kid who on the way up to make sure as he's doing it or she's doing it to say like, Hey, everyone come with me. This is what we need to do. Then that's asking a lot of our youth. The answer to your question is all four of my children just assume they're going to college. They think they're going to go to the college where their dad teaches. Like, we're going to go over here and we're going to take classes with you. And college, everyone who they know, uh, probably everybody in this neighborhood has a college degree in some form or fashion. So in that sense, it is ordinary. And that's the strange thing about it. They're going to go, yeah, I'll go to college um, and I'll do A, B, and C. One of the other things that is interesting is that I think about all the things that I didn't know. My sister, who was two years older than me, was the first person in our generation, like our family, to kind of go to college on our side of the family. Well, actually, on both sides of the family, my mom's side and my dad's side. My sister is two years old, the first one to graduate from college. I was the second. But we didn't know anything about financial aid and Pell Grants and those other kinds of things. And I know for a fact that there are still kids whose parents didn't go to college and they don't know how it works. And what tends to happen is counselors are overwhelmed and they mm -hmm. tend to focus on kind of the top 5%. And there's yeah. tons of kids who could probably go to college who don't know the way to get there. And so one of the hard things to do is to get that information into communities. And that's what I'm talking about. I may not be able to say, you know, I can't go back in time and say to the other people, hey, did you know that you could just get a Pell Grant and go to the state school down the road and do A, B, and C? But I can go to some families in the church that we attend in Chicago and say, mm -hmm. Here is, I'm going to do a session on, on college applications. And yeah. so I do feel like a lot of what I do now is to get, one of the things that people don't realize is how much being around other people with money gives you access to residual information that you think is common knowledge that isn't common knowledge. And part of what I try to do is just give that common knowledge to people who lack it. I just want to take a few moments to thank our partner. Attribution is distributed in part by Chasing the Dream, a public media initiative from the WNET Group reporting on poverty, justice, 
and economic opportunity in America. You can learn more at pbs.org slash chasing the dream. Now back to the show. It's interesting because, you know, depending upon how you grew up, you have common knowledge within your community that's different from others. So like, I wondered when you wrote in that piece, the phrase government cheese, yeah. how many readers knew what you were talking about? <laughs> and I and I did. I remember these giant blocks. Like I, I'm assuming the same that you got these giant blocks of cheese. You know, everyone else is, you know, people are talking about like craft singles or like things you would slice <laughs> fresh at the deli. And I'm like, what is that? And it's like, no, oh, these giant blocks of cheese. Yes. And and to me, what's interesting about that is that, you know, I didn't think about it at the time. I, didn't, I don't know if I felt, I don't know if I, if I or if my mom felt shame or embarrassment about getting that help, but it does sort of speak to like, even when you're in the moment, you may not be seeing these little things that are sort of helping yeah. you along the way. And to the extent to which then, I don't know if you've had this experience, that's why I'm, I'm so thankful that you wrote it, that if you did, once you sort of quote unquote, you like make it or get out, then you don't talk about those things anymore, yeah. right? And in doing so, you don't you you depress the value so that when things like we have to vote or fund something, people are like, oh, people are just using you know uh, yes. food stamp money to get sort of potato chips and stuff like that. And you're like, no, 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 that's that was a you know that was really helpful. I'm glad that you mentioned this point, and maybe we shouldn't explore it too far. But I remember I had this idea, and what it was is that my life started to change. So I went from being in poverty to college to graduate school. And in my brain, the world was changing along with me. In other words, I used to have this idea that, oh, people, black people used to be poor. Then we went to college. And so I created this narrative that the world progressed as I progressed. Mm. And then I realized I had this, I remember this clear thought. I remember it clear as day. Just because the world is changing for me, it doesn't mean it's changing for everyone. Yeah. And the things that I needed so that I could survive long enough for my world to change, people who are in my situation need those same things as well. And I think you're correct that too often we get to where we get to because of the help of other people, and we then eliminate those things from our narrative, and we center ourselves, and then we say that other people should have the things, they should have the same grit that we did. But I can tell you for a fact that I needed that government cheese. I can tell you for a fact my mom had a brain tumor. She could not work. If we didn't get that money, we would have been homeless. That's a fact. Yeah. My entire childhood, I was, was funded by the United States government, but through government assistance because of my mom's disability. That's just a fact. Yeah. And I, I would never, never take that from someone else. The government invested, right? There was an investment, you know, in this idea that like, you know, hey, you know, people have hardship. And it's not through any fault of their own. And when there's a hardship, that's what we're here for. We're, you know, like, you know, we're here to help our neighbors, right? That's what the taxation system is, at its essence sort of is, right? So, for example, and, and maybe these things do bother me because my mom went to work. She was working 12 hours a week yep. at a factory job until she got sick and she couldn't do it anymore. And she used that money to buy our food and our clothes. And if once a year... She bought me a video game. I remember these things like the welfare moms, the welfare yeah. queens when I was a kid. Like, God forbid that my mom, you know, every now and then took us out to McDonald's. Or my mom bought me a video game that was strictly not on budget during Christmas. And, and what I'm saying is that sometimes we try to suck all of the joy out of poverty as if this right. is what's going to make these kids work even harder. Let's yeah. limit the ways they can spend this money because otherwise they'll waste it. I want to I want to pivot to a question of faith. I'm going to lead with my own story uh, myself, and I, hopefully I, I don't sort of drag it on too long. But years ago, I was at a conference, and I was on this really fascinating panel where it was myself, a CIA agent, and a, a, a member of the clergy. <laughs> Sounds like a bad joke, right? <laughs> yeah, no, that sounds and great. So, and so I had just gone through, I was talking about sort of my own journey and how I was always sort of wondering and sort of plagued by, someone had asked the question in the audience. And I was like, well, I've always been sort of like trying to figure out like, how did I end up here? You know, what was it? You know, what, how did I end up where I am versus these other places? And I talked about, you know, the, the, the role that my mom played in protecting me, but I also talked about scholarships and Pell Grants and, and, and federal assistance and, and mentors and teachers and stuff like that. And when I finished, uh, the member of the clergy who was a spiritual advisor to President Obama, I won't mention uh, uh, the person by name, but he said, well, I actually, I think I'll tell you 
I'll tell you why. You know, I know the answer to your question of how you ended up here. And he said, uh, God had a plan for you. Yeah. And I understand where he's coming from. Yeah. I understand what he meant. But I wanted to sort of probe into sort of this question of faith and belief because the other, because the other thing you 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 draw the opposite of that in that like well did did does God have a plan for someone who doesn't make it out? Does did yeah. God have a plan for that? And and just by way of background, I grew up you know when I was younger, I think we went to church. It was probably like Lutheran or something like that. We were in Boston, and then we we moved we we moved into a place where. Uh, I got really immersed in the church. It was, uh, you know, the name of the church was Cal- Calvary Baptist. It was an evangelical sort of born again kind of thing. Very fear-based, right? Yeah. You come and you sort of profess your belief in God or you will spend the rest yeah. of the way. And I remember watching those movies, which just scared the hell out of you like the day after, you know. And yeah, you get snatched up or whatever. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. you're literally, you're, 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 everyone else, everyone's gone and you're left. And then people are, you know, literally the, the literal interpretation of revelations, I guess. And so, so you know, I, I had enough belief baked in, both positive and, and things that I questioned. But but I, I wanted just to sort of press upon you, like, I, I believe in myself, I believe in a higher being, I have faith that you you don't understand everything, you know, God does have his ways. But, but I also know that there are other things that contribute to how someone ends up where they do that are beyond, that, yeah. that maybe are beyond sort of that answer. And I'm wondering how you respond to belief in God as it relates to the outcomes of people. Yeah, I, th- I think that I have a particular way that history kind of functions. And you talked a lot about storytelling. And for me, what was a big challenge for me, A big I wrote a book called Reading While Black, and it mm-hmm. had a real influence on me writing the book. And I started reading a lot about this, uh, the faith of the enslaved black people. Mm-hmm. So during the time before the Civil War, African Americans become Christians, and how do they make sense of their own faith? And I read a lot of things that were that that, that kind of that that, sh- that that shape how I viewed the world. In other words, I read in particular around the Emancipation Proclamation and into the different towns where slaves were free, and the slaves made this claim that God was at work to bring about our liberation. And when they said that. It, it 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 really it really um, challenged me because so often I look full I look at my current life and the people around me who are suffering and I kind of go well where was God mm-hmm. and then I kind of go well the people when my people were enslaved they said God's going to free us one day and then when God freed them they say see we told you <laughs> and, <laughs> and and but but then it made me think about this is the important part. It talks about like how events in history functions and how our stories function. In other words, these stories that we tell ourselves were both backwards and forwards. So when God frees the slaves, as they tell the story, then for their in their mind, it vindicated the faiths of their ancestors who passed this thing down to them. Mm. But it also works forward to give people hope. Okay, now I'm in the middle of a difficult situation. I look back on previous times in my own life and in the lives of my people to say, well, God was at work there. So in other words, I think that there's these historical events that that show that that God has not abandoned his people. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't mean that in every single circumstance is he going to do those things again, but that there is enough evidence out there for me to understand that though I can't see everything, I kind of move through life with that sense of trust. And for me, like that central that central event isn't actually just the liberation of the slaves. It's what I believe about the resurrection, that I believe that like a long time ago, there was a guy named Jesus who died and yep. he came back to life, which shows that God has power. And so these these kinds of events where God shows himself were never meant to be, this is what you get every single time, right. but it's meant to be that you're not abandoned. I think that's kind of how love is, right? Yeah. You have these events where you kind of say, we've had this experience together, and this experience together cements us, and it helps us through these dark times. So that when you and your spouse, you or your partner, whoever it is, you're going through these things, you kind of, I remember yeah. I remember. Now, one of the things that happens, and this is this is what I think is the difficult part, and this is the, the this is the mystery of faith. Sometimes things happen in your life that are so difficult that it causes you to relitigate your past. 
In other words, something happens in the present that is so bad, you kind of reconsider what you thought. Oh, man, I really thought this was true. But in light of this new circumstance, like I can no longer believe. So maybe I had faith in God, but this really bad thing happened to me and now I have to reconsider it. And what I would say to me is, for me, that event that's kind of broken my spirituality has never, it's actually occurred, but yeah. it's been re, it's been, it's been restored time and time again. And it's almost like at this point, me and God are stuck with one another. I just can't, I can't quit them. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and even when it would be easier, I mean, it's like, yeah. I think the people, and I know you don't want to, you don't want to homilize here, but it's not like that, like faith solves every problem. In a lot of ways, faith makes things more complicated, but it's just, it's how, I feel a real sense of responsibility to my aunt, to like my, the, the black people who came yeah. before me. Like they said these things and I feel like I believe their testimony. Like I believe the testimony of Martin Luther King who was inspired by faith to change America. And he said, I can change it. And he did. Yeah. And so those, those, those are the kinds of things that I think helped me make my way through life. Well, it's interesting because it's the way you describe it in terms of like, you know, faith and I'm paraphrasing here. So correct me if I'm missing what you were saying, but it's this notion that, you know, looking back, faith can provide meaning because we see the the stories can make more sense to us and looking forward, it can provide us hope. And I guess what I'm speaking to is the ways in which, and I don't want to get overly political here, but the ways in which faith can be used as, as an excuse or a reason, right? And so I, I take, you know, I, going into the elections, I had numerous discussions with people who yeah. are evangelical, and they were voting yeah. in a way that I thought was not consistent with a lot of Christian beliefs in terms of yes. helping the poor. You can read between the lines here, but 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 I also see it in terms of people who are opting not to vaccinate it because they'll say, "Well, if God thinks it's my time, then it's my yeah. time." Right? I can say something about yeah. that. I, I don't want to. Make, you don't have to ask the question; I'll answer it. One of the things is there's been, and one one way to look at American history is to look at it as like a two thousand a two hundred and fifty year theological debate. Especially as it relates to the faith of African Americans and the faith of kind of oftentimes um, the majority of the Christian community. And we have always seen these, it's, it's all about like where you put the emphasis on these narratives. So in the African American tradition, the Exodus narrative has always been paradigmatic. God is the God who sees the oppressed reaches out and he liberates them. And so God, as the one who cares about the stepdome people, is what black Christians had. So we didn't have any political power. We couldn't vote. We, we, we didn't have any land. All we could say to the majority of America was like, God opposes what you're doing to us. And so in the African-American Christian tradition, there's always been this sense in which God cares about the disinherited. But there's always been another Christian tradition that also existed at the same time in America, where religion was used to acquire power and to hoard power and to step on the hurting people of the world. That's the reason why you have the abolitionist movement and you have the pro-slavery movement, both of whom claim God as Mm -hmm. their source. You had the exact same thing happen in the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement was a fundamentally Christian activity. There were there were Jews who were involved, there were um atheists who were involved, but the Southern Christian Leadership Council led by Martin Luther King were, were largely black clergy who said God wants us to have equal rights. And t- the sad part about that is a lot of the people who opposed it were also clergy. So the firm, the famous letter to a Birmingham jail was written from Martin Luther King in jail to white clergy. And so there always has been this tension in American politics between people who use religion to acquire power and then use that power to make themselves wealthy. And there's always been a strand of the church from Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth to Martin Luther King to the present day who said the way in which you're using that Christianity to do these things bears false witness about God. And I would say that um, that's just the nature of kind of the political and religious world in which we inhabit. And, and it is the case that sometimes religion has been used poorly to justify the oppression of other people. But what I want to say is if, if religion was used to build it, it can also be used to tear down those kinds of ways of being in the world. That's kind of how I make sense of that. You know, as you say that, and again, reflecting upon the lecture I watched of yours last night, I am such a huge fan and proponent of origin stories, like trying to understand where something came from. You know, the whole idea of this podcast attribution is like trying to understand what do we attribute our outcomes to. And, you know, I have to be honest with you, like I had, you know, I've been to different churches of different denominations and you try to figure out what's the difference here versus there. And you you basically 
sometimes it comes down to sort of like, uh, you know, a definition by or distinction by traditions, you know, like they do this here, they do that there in terms of what's actually happening in the service. But to me, what was really fascinating in hearing your answer there and, and listening to your previous lecture was just all of these things have an origin, right? Yeah. And also those origins, different people are telling stories about that origin that may be true. And I just wonder, like, I don't think we spend a lot of time Maybe we spend some time investigating our own faith, like what we believe in. I don't think there's a lot of comparative, like, you know, where did yeah. this come from or how is it different from somewhere else? Because, you know, listening to you talk about this makes me understand and appreciate and interrogate my own faith more and also understand, you know, where others are coming from. When Christianity comes to black people and we are enslaved, slavery isn't a moral issue and in the abstract, it's a legal issue. It's inscribed in law. The first question that the black Christian has to answer is, does God will my slavery or does he will my freedom? And the black Christian says as a whole, God wills my freedom. And if God wills my freedom, that immediately brings me into conflict with the state. So black Christianity was from the beginning, from its inception in America, inextricably political and religious. Now, if at the exact same time, there's a largely white Christian audience who say God wills your slavery and he wants you as the underclass, then there's a version of Christianity that is rooted in maintaining power and the status quo. And these two forms of Christianity have been in basically perpetual conflict since that moment. And the amazing thing about it is, and I don't want to valorize it too much, both of those things existed in the same space. In other words, in the African-American Christian tradition, there was still the personal transformation. There was still the life with God that many people had. One of the interesting things about this, and this is what I talk about in my neighborhood, we there was a structural problem, right? There was the, the, the things that were going on above our head, redlining things. But then there was the personal integrity problem, the things that we did to one another, the ways that we harm one another. And both of those things were problems in my neighborhood. And my faith actually addressed both of those things. It wasn't just to say the government is mean to me. It's like, no, no, no. The government does these things to me. But Esau, you sometimes participate in the harm that you do to other people. And you have to really consider how your life impacts others. And both of those things, I think, come from an African-American Christian tradition that had to make sense of itself in the context of both legal oppression and the need for personal transformation. You just said something I just want to touch upon because, and, and again, I'm not looking, you know, uh, for yeah. you to provide the answer, right? Um, maybe it's just sort of referring to some things that we should be looking at or exploring on our own. But you said that within the black church, there's the tradition of being able to understand sort of, you know, the idea of, of the systemic oppression Yes. And the questions of personal integrity, right? Yeah. And and I think that's a really interesting framework. I see that in the national conversation that we have about race today, that those, yes. t- I don't know if those two things are opposed to each other or if, yeah. if some people don't feel comfortable having it. So, I mean, obviously it's, it, I think it's more people or, you know, it, with a lot of the foundations I work with, a lot of other people are talking about sort of the, you know, need the need to address systemic racism, you know, and, and yeah. all of that is great. But, but I don't think that they feel comfortable at all talking about personal integrity or some, yeah. some of that. And I don't know if on the other side, you know, maybe they're thinking it's all about personal choice and don't want to acknowledge any of the systemic issues. And, you know, we don't do nuance well as a country, I like to say, but I'm just wondering how you, like, how do we go about having a better conversation without fear of, like, you know, if someone acknowledges the question of personal integrity, that all of a sudden someone is somehow diminishing that there is oppression, which is not the point. It's saying that there's both. What I want to say is, I remember... The short answer to your question is both of those things are parts of why people still suffer. And what I want to say is I remember growing up and having other poor people mistreat me. I remember other people telling me that I wasn't going to be anything. Not just like people outside of my community, but people inside of my community. I remember being bullied in school. I remember how sometimes the way that black men treated some black women. So I saw this. I saw this. And so, yes, I can say that the structures in society create a nihilism that manifests itself in local communities. I can acknowledge that. But I can also acknowledge that we're moral agents. 
that we have agency and that we're not completely the victims of society. And the hard thing to do is to acknowledge the, the what's going on in society. I may be just repeating what you say, but also speak about personal responsibility. Because if my mom can say to me, yes, this game is rigged, but you are not defined by that. There's a sense in which I'm still a moral agent. Mm. And I think that what we have to be able to do is to both analyze the brokenness in the system, but at the same time say, you know, there are elements of our own responsibility. One of the, and, and, and I hate to use like a, a, a biblical example, but forgive me, but there's a story of Judas. There's a story of Judas in the Bible where Judas is the one who betrays Jesus and Jesus goes off and he gets killed. And one of the weird things about the Bible is it says two things about Judas. It says that what happened to Jesus was predestined, that Jesus was always going to die on the cross, but that Judas is responsible for his actions. It's divine responsibility, divine sovereignty and human responsibility in a particular person. Judas is both responsible for his own actions, but there's also a sense in which he's a part of this wider plan. Now, I want to say there's something similar when you begin to think about uh, what's going on in the world in which we inhabit. Namely, there is a sense to which there, there are elements of American society that makes it difficult for Black people to flourish or people in general to flourish who grow up in poverty. But there's also the responsibility that sometimes in our own distress, we reach out and harm other people. And it is also the case that if you remove every single injustice in the world, if the world was completely equal, there'd be certain people who didn't succeed because they didn't work hard enough. And that shows you that there's a part of all of this that involves the human person. And I think that we have to keep that um, that idea as a part of the conversation. The, 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 the real danger is this is the problem. When you when you talk about personal responsibility as if that's all that there is, mm -hmm. then people are afraid to talk about it at all because they're afraid that people then won't want to help. One of the questions I struggle with all of the time is, is this racist or not? Mm. <laughs> you know, you, you, in, in my brain, I'm wondering, well, they could be doing this because of a racial bias. But they could also just be socially awkward. Right. And in my head, I'm always doing this kind of calculus. And what that means is I got to be able to have an, an, an honest conversation. Sometimes as a black person, I will look at an event on the news and go, that's tragic, but it's not racial. And I can allow, I can allow myself to say that that's not particularly racist while at the same time acknowledging these things. But I feel like what's going on in society, maybe you can edit it down to this point. Every single event it's become a litigation on the entirety of our history. Mm -hmm. Every single trial, every single event, every single news story is never about the story itself, but the entirety. America is constantly on trial. Right. And I think if we can admit that America is broken, then we can actually discuss these very these individual things and begin to make some progress. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting sort of a uh, note there. It shouldn't be that difficult to acknowledge the horrific sort of origins of our country and the things that were, I mean, they're, I, I don't know how they can be defended, right? That's, it seems yes. impossible, but at the same point to constantly litigate every event, as you mentioned, through the, those original sins is a real challenge. And I don't know if it's ultimately productive for moving things forward. And what I'm saying is, and this is, this may be like, you talk about parts, it's not litigating it through, it's as if these events prove something that already that we already know the case. Mm. So, in other words, people who want to absolve or convict America do so on the on the basis of each individual event. And so, if one person is found guilty or not guilty, it's supposed to validate or invalidate a narrative. But what I want to say is the narrative is already there. It's already there. We know. And so now we need to get to the place of saying, how can we create a society in which justice is consistent instead of looking to create that society through these particular events? Because the, the cases can't bear that weight. Right. We need to create a legal system where this becomes 
ordinary instead of having to litigate the validity of our legal system in each individual case. In other words, we need to get about the business of creating a just society instead of using each trial to de- decide whether or not it's a just society. And the reason that this, the latter occurs is because we're not convinced. We haven't owned it. And because we haven't owned it, we can never converse with one another. We're never talking about the exact event. We're talking about America. And I feel like, at least personally, I know what America is. Right. And because I know what America is, I can get about the process of trying to make it as just and fair as possible. Well, out of curiosity, what do you think owning it looks like? Is it an individual sort of thing? Is it is it organizational? Is it sort of political entity? What is what is owning it ultimately look like? I think that owning it means not litigating it. In other words, if we acknowledge that that um, racism is a part of our society that is not just interpersonal, but it exists in structures, mm-hmm. that we can actually have a, a, a honest discussion. And we can say things like people of goodwill can agree or disagree on the relative nature of the relative intensity of racism in any particular circumstance. In other words, we like I, I, the way that I talk about it is racism is like a sin in any like any other kind of yeah. law in society. Like greed. Right. Like we all recognize that greed is it, it exists in society and that many corporations are are, are 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 influenced by greed and therefore they create laws that benefit those corporations and that the work of eradicating kind of corporate greed and thrift is this endless fight that we got to nonetheless engage in because it's a part of the world in which we live. Nobody's going to disagree with that. And then politicians can disagree on what's the best way to make sure that billion dollar corporations are held accountable. Yeah. And that's the nature of the debate. The, the nature of the debate is the scope of the accountability and how you bring it about. Well, the problem is we don't always acknowledge that these structural inequalities are also a part of the air that we breathe. And so we're not actually debating on the best way to solve the problem. We're still debating whether or not there is a problem. And so the first step is to own the debate. And this is the thing. Sometimes we could then acknowledge that there are different ways to get at the same problem. Like, how do you hold corporations accountable? There are different proposals. And then you debate back and forth. And it becomes a dialogue. In other words, I don't think that we're, as a country, actually dialoguing on how to make America more just and fair. We're still debating whether or not there's real inequality that needs to be addressed. Mm. So owning it means making that an ordinary part of the national conversation instead of being afraid to touch it. I could talk to you for hours <laughs> about this and other things, but I want to yes. be respectful that we're, we're blowing past our allotted time. So I want to close with uh, one final question. And that's, you know, traditionally you do a podcast or whatever, and at the end the credits roll and you're like, you know, or you say like, thanks to the production yeah. engineer and the music and stuff. I like to cede some of that time to the guest to offer up credits of their own, who they'd yeah. like to give credit for. It could be for who you are today. It could be of a recent accomplishment. But, you know, as we said before with the, the teacher, Susan, you mentioned, I just think there's such power in terms of just taking opportunities to say thanks to someone. And so yeah. um, put you on the spot here. But uh, I was wondering if you, if there's anyone you'd like to to give a quick sort of shout out. Yeah, I would like to thank, the, first of all, uh, my wife. She was one of those people who bet on me when it didn't seem like the best bet in college. So I'm always grateful to her. I would not be able to be where I am without my wife. And obviously my kids, those four kids exhaust me. They're also a tremendous <laughs> source of joy. And they sometimes they listen to my podcast. So I got to say their actual names. That'd be Luke, Claire, Peter, and Miriam. More recently, I want to thank my pastor. I attend Progressive Baptist Church in Chicago. Charlie Dates, he, he, we've been there for the last six months and it's been a real source of joy and healing to my family. These are recent people, a friend of mine named Justin Gibney and Watson Jones. They've just been real sources of counsel. And Tish Harrison Warren, who's a writer, she inspired me to really think carefully about the craft of writing. So I wouldn't be where I am without her. So these are the recent people who I would I would really like to think. Growing up, I would say it's my mom. If, if it wasn't for the imagination and, and the hope that she put inside of me, I don't think I would be able to function. The coach that I had, Harold Wells, and and the ways that he taught me kind of what it really meant to struggle, not just in sports, but for integrity. He was actually also a pastor, too. Maybe I was doomed to be religious because I was <laughs> surrounded by these clergy. And the, and the pastor of the church that I was a part of growing up, Oscar Montgomery, which would be Union Hill Primitive Baptist Church in Huntsville, Alabama. And obviously, Susan Bailey for believing in a... Um, a kid from 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 J.L. Johnson High School and basically my entire neighborhood. Sorry, shout out to Northwest Huntsville, J.L. Johnson High School and all of the people who said that we couldn't do it.
it and we did it. And for all of us who survived and who thrived, God bless you and God bless your family. Your stories are never over as long as they're continuing. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time for your thoughtfulness. I really enjoyed this conversation and best of luck with all you're doing. And thanks for the service you're doing in terms of sharing your story and your perspective. Uh, I can only imagine how valuable people are finding it. Thank you so much. And I'll be happy to come back anytime you invite me. Thank you for listening to Attribution. This show was edited by Luke Robert Mason, music by Johnny Most Davis. Attribution is a production of the Moving Up Media Lab whose mission is to inspire people to reflect on who and what has made their lives possible. To learn more and sign up for our weekly newsletter, please visit movingupusa.com. Today's final credit goes to you, the listener, and to everyone who helped you get to where you are today. If this show has reminded you of someone in particular, make their day and let them know.